Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Good evening. My name is Keisha Rogers, and I want to welcome you all and thank you for joining us for tonight's strategic update for Monday, March 21st. And I'm going to be joined by my colleague, Michael Steger. I want to, first of all, uh, make sure again, everyone knows that it is really important uh, that given what we are in the midst of and what we're presenting on these Monday discussions, that as many people that can join the dialogue and discussion by signing up on LaRouchePack.com, uh, do so join us in these live discussions. As you know, uh, for those who listen on YouTube in the follow-up, we will be posting the opening remarks of the discussion. And in order to be participate live, you need to be registered to be on these calls and discussions. And I want to say that up front because we are getting quite a response to the YouTube channel when this discussion goes up there uh, and a number of people watching. So I want to encourage people again to get involved more with what we're doing. So before I turn it over to Michael, I just want to kind of set the stage a little bit around what LaRouche Pack is engaged in, in terms of representing the voice of sanity and the saner voices for the total devastation that we're seeing right now in the treasonous leadership, one represented by the Biden collective and two by the neocons, neoliberals and warmongers who are pushing the continued war propaganda that I have to say, as we have indicated and noted in the number of our reports and articles, and most of you are seeing from your response and friends and relatives that the American people are not buying and are not being pushed into accepting this war propaganda or being called a tool of Vladimir Putin or anyone else as we're looking at the, the real issue at hand right now is that the United States is being destroyed by the policies that were put forth by those who thought that they could continue to propagate the, the lie against uh, to, toward the American people, such as what we've seen, the lie going back to weapons of mass destruction, getting us into endless wars, getting us into a war in Iraq, and also the Russia, Russia, Russia collusion, and the total attack on the American people and the attack that has been put forth by the globalist agenda that was immediately, or that was the attempt to run a coup, a fascist coup against Donald Trump, the president of the United States, when he made clear that we had to put an end to these endless war policies. And we actually had to address the needs of the America First agenda to revive our productive economy. And this is at the forefront of what we're discussing now, the question of the moral fitness to, of, to survive of the American people. It's not just enough to go after the traitors and the lunatics in Congress, although the campaign that we're waging right now is that we have to clean house. For 2022, we have already identified those who are not fit to represent and who are out to destroy the United States. And I know a number of you received our initiative to go after the warmongers and neocons who were calling on were calling on Joe Biden to escalate the hit, escalate the support for Polish MiGs fighter jets in Ukraine and those who are continuing to say that we have to put Ukraine and the interest of Ukraine before the United States, before the American people. These people need to be counseled, need to be eliminated from our government. 
And the American people have to act now to one, understand what is required to actually lead. What is the question, what is required for actual durable survival? And what does it mean to be fit to survive in this time of crisis? What it means is that we need to understand the necessary solutions to the ongoing crisis. And I think what I want to point your attention to before I turn it over to, to Michael, if I can pull this up quickly here, okay, is for those who miss, who may have listened to the discussion, I think you can see this. This is our LaRouche Pack website on Saturday. We continued our class series on the initiative around ending the Federal Reserve, the unconstitutional Federal Reserve system and implementing the policies, replacing it with a national bank policy. And we've heard a expansion of this discussion from Bob Ingram, which I encourage people to go back and watch his three presentations he did on the role, the unconstitutional role of the Federal Reserve and what a national banking system entails. This weekend, we heard from Brian Lance. And if you didn't have a chance to listen to his discussion on, I think the title here is appropriate, Saving America. Because the question is, whose responsibility is it to save the United States? It's we, the people, who have to understand our role in participating in bring about, bringing about a true sovereign republic. And the question of the type of credit system that needs to go into rebuilding our national economy, our productive economy. And Ryan laid that out very clearly, as well as the consequences and threats we face if we don't push, put forth the necessary remedy and solutions to the ongoing war drive and crisis that we're seeing right now, which starts with the economic solutions. And finally, as I stated, in the second, the latest article on the website is the second, I believe, second series of Tony Pappard's Saner Voices. And as you see here, the article title states, get rid of the rhinos and neocons for good at last. And he goes through in here, uh, again, some of the voices that are speaking out against the war propaganda and really stating the consequences of what we face if we allow for the warmongers and neocons to continue to run the psi war and the psyops, which we talked about in the last, last week's call against the American people. And when you have the people such as Tulsi Gabbard, Tucker Carlson, which we've named a number of times, Colonel uh, and former advisor to President Trump, uh, Colonel Doug McGregor, who <laughs> some of these people are being deemed to be the Putin wing of the of the Republican Party, and you know because they are speaking out against the atrocities of the neocons and warmongers when they're truly representing what is should be known as the true America first policy agenda. So I want you to take a look at that. And most people saw the uh, article from Barbara Boyd that took up not only the question of the atrocious actions of the insane Congress members saluting Nazi apparatus in, in Ukraine with the, the speech given by Zelensky, but also the fact of the matter of what is the true fight underway right now? What's the true war? And it's the war against the American economy. And she lays that out very clearly. And what we have to understand in order to defeat this, the, this apparatus that's out to destroy the United States. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Michael. There you are. All right. OK, hi, guys. Hi. So thanks, Keisha. Um, the um, I'm gonna I'm gonna maybe 
touch on something that's a little bit what people might suspect is outside the scope of the current situation. Um, but I, I think it's fair to say at this point, and, and you know, Keisha just mentioned Barbara Boyd's article on Zelensky. You know, I think as you look at the situation and as we find out more about what's actually happening and been happening in Ukraine for the last few years, remember it was President Trump who withheld funding. Um, he, he wanted to evaluate what role the Ukraine government and various apparatus uh, played in the attempted coup against him. But I think we'll find that the Ukrainian both administration and its armed forces give a whole new meaning to the, the idea of the cocaine cowboys. But I think if we look at the situation without having a detailed analysis, there are some on the ground reports people will find, but we can, we can say from a basic evaluation that the Russians have militarily dominated the territories they intended to, that all of the propaganda otherwise is a complete lie. And the questions that remain are the questions of to what degree do we get a resolution politically in Ukraine? Um, while, and while Zelensky continues to play the puppet for you know, global interests, globalist interests, who would rather see the Ukrainian population grounded down like they were in Syria or Libya, Afghanistan or Iraq. And that's always been the plan. And the coup of Ukraine in 2014 was simply part of that Obama's permanent war, permanent revolution policy. So this is just a subsequent outcome ultimately of sacrificing the people of Ukraine. But this has been resolved. It is unlikely, though remains possible, to escalate into nuclear war. That much of that is a kind of fear and control tactic. More importantly, this was used as a way of controlling the political dialogue in our country. I'll give you one example. Mark Levin, Mark Levin, who does, uh, I think, Life, Liberty, and, Le and Levin on Sundays on Fox. I don't know if it was last night or the week before. Going through that this America first wing is the pro-Putin wing of the Republican Party. And that really America first is now America last. That the people that are most concerned about the livelihoods, well-being, productive, stability, honesty of our country, of our political leadership, are in Mark Levin's terms now last, the last concern when it comes to these globalist war agendas. That people like Levin or Hannity or Lindsay, the little old lady from South Carolina, Lindsey Graham or Romney, almost every member of Cong the Senate, most members of Congress. Some of them will be better. You know, people like Josh Hawley who claimed himself Senator from Missouri to be a great Senator from Missouri, America first, true Trumper, he's fully on board. There's about seven or eight in the House Republicans. Um, people like Laura Boebert, um, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Matt Goetz, Chip Roy, Andy Biggs. Some people actually voted against this Ukrainian insanity. But few, and all of the, re all of the senators, even Rand Paul, he probably knows better. But he, he, his only argument is that we don't want to expand the government debt to support this, this, this is insane this insane th th postmodern theater. Biden and this regime invited Russia to invade because they needed an escalation of war to control the political dialogue in the United States. COVID was collapsing, the economy is tanking, hyperinflation is setting in, the regime is weak, Kamala is a pothead incompetent, Biden doesn't know where he is 95% of the time, and the other 5% he knows he's napping. You don't have any competence. You have no responsibility. You have no accountability. And they drove Russia. In, they basically asked and begged for a war. And Putin said, I've got to have security concerns. They've got to be secured. And they were not explicitly. They did everything possible to provoke the war. 
Okay, so if that being said, and yet Russia has largely handled this exactly the way they planned and intended, people may have disagreements on certain aspects, but in general, that's the, I think that's a true characteristic. What does a functioning American presidency do right now? If President Trump walks in there tomorrow, if you're the president of the United States and you walk in there tomorrow, what do you do? What is your immediate, what is your first immediate thrust to address this crisis? And part of that, part of that is the fact that there are major economic implications that what is being done, one aspect is of course the war. And what the war does is just increasingly make the United States an illegitimate world power. It's an attempting to undercut the character and integrity of the United States, our political system, the, 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 the long and critical history of the United States as, as a nation state. It's meant to destroy that principle, that idea. And they do the same thing globally as they do in the United States. They're destroying that concept within the American people, the same globalist interests. That's why Pelosi you know, is there basically sniffing the butt of Zelensky every day, because this is their program. It's to destroy the United States. It's not Pelosi's. She can barely find her false teeth. It's the program of a British imperial kind of program, that if you destroy the United States, that you ultimately create what they call multipolarity or multilateralism. And more, and more, so, more so is it's multipolarity in this case. That means there is no principle. It means each nation will have its region, its territory, its interests, and it will try to control and dominate those in various parts of the world. That doesn't function. And there's a reason why. And I wanna get at that um, in the introduction of our, of our discussion tonight, and then, and then try to open up. But I think we have to start immediately, immediately as, a, as a responsibility of true citizens. How do we pull together now the concept of a functioning presidency? Why do I say that? Because yes, we have to secure the election. Yes, we have to make sure we address the ongoing insanity of what took place with the coup, the election. We just got the report from the New York Times. Guess what? The, 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 the laptop was real, who would have thunk? All of those things have to be addressed. We have to purge, purge these rhinos and neocons from the party. It has to be an actual public denunciation. You are not in the party. You are not committed to the country. It's time to pull rank. It's time to be deadly serious about the future of our nation and civilization. And these people, Levin, Hannity, and a lot of others, Rupert Murdoch himself is a notorious globalist. And, and, and One America News and Newsmax have been practically in lockstep on this situation. So we're gonna to try to get at the essence of it. And perhaps a proposal about what a real presidency would function. Because at this point, what President Trump is thinking and what you need to be thinking, and what every citizen out there that wants to pull this country together, this patriotic movement, is how are we going to pull together a functioning policy and recruit the necessary personnel to implement it? You can have the nice idea. You don't have the people. If you've got a Nazi coup being run inside your own administration, if every presidential discussion is leaked, like it was by the Nazis inside our own government during President Trump's first term, then, then you have no ability to have a, function, a coherent policy or idea, even if it's the right one. We've got to pull together the actual, you've got to start to pull together an administration, a personnel. And that means you have to have a clear concept of what America first means today. And a portion of that is how do we secure the dollar-based system? As I think everyone on this call is now aware, Brian Lance discussed this on Saturday. How are we going to secure that there isn't this massive destruction to the dollar-based system. You know, post-war period, British interests looking to regain their kind of dominance globally against the United States, look to undermine the Bretton Woods 
dollar-based system. And they exploited the trade imbalances we had with Germany and Japan especially. And they looked to exploit that to weaken it and then get Nixon under the advice of George Shultz, perhaps the, more, the most evil political bureaucrat in our nations in, in the 20th century or second half. But George Shultz with Nixon to pull the dollar off the gold reserve standard and to greatly weaken it. It forced us to become dependent on the oil exports of the Saudis to secure the dollar-based system. That today is threatened. And it's going to require a very clear commitment from a functioning US president and policy people, the broader ability. Because our State Department, as Trump effectively said, is a deep state department. There is perhaps no other executive department that has more, been more destructive to US interests in terms of the American people. Not an elite, not a bureaucracy. When we say the United States, what we refer to are the actual physical interests of the American people in total, the general welfare principle, the preamble of our constitution, that commitment, that interest. We're gonna, have to, we're gonna have to take the necessary steps to pull that dollar system and what that represents. And so what I wanna do is quickly just share, just to make this discussion a little bit more, to make the domain of this discussion a little more clear. Uh, let me make, to make the, the nature of this discussion a little bit more clear, let me just share this image. Now, what is this? This is, this is an, a representation of, of Einstein's conception of general relativity and gravity. So many of you are probably at least semi-familiar with this. So the idea is that the Earth or some planet um, has a gravitational effect that is curving space and time. And the gridded lines you can see are curved by the Earth. Um, at least that's how it's often described. And the way it's assumed is that the mass of the Earth is so great that it has affected what Einstein identified as the, 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 the gravitational field and the, even characteristics of space and time, the way light would move, that light would move in a curved fashion because of the effect of the Earth. Now, what that assumes is that the formation of the Earth happened, and as it happened, it affected the curvature of physical space-time, or it affected the gravitational field, however you want to, you know, either way. It's synonymous, I guess. But what I, I would suggest and, and in doing so, I would be restoring the, nation, the notion of the creator of God back into the questions of scientific hypothesis, which to a functioning human being are integrated conceptions. The separation of religion and science is perhaps the deepest and most vicious cultural attack upon any culture. But to, 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 instead of saying that the matter, that the material, of Earth aggregated somehow based on mechanical forces. And that happened to change the curvature of the universal field, the field of gravitation. I'd say invert it. What if the, the principle or the, the, the characteristic curvature of physical space time, the curvature of the gravitational field, was what shaped Earth, is what shaped the nature and characteristic of our Earth, or you could say more broadly, to expand it just one step further, shaped the characteristic of formation of our solar system, because it's shaped as a system. And that you're identifying that the principle is what is substantial, the effects the principle of gravitation, 
something that, that was created by the creator, which then shaped the formation of particular characteristics, of predicates, what we perceive with our senses. And this would be a, a fundamental shift in the way we think of science. I would say this is true science. And the alternative, whether it's the empiricism or reductionism or all the other tendencies that have floated within scientific thought, are scientism or scientism. That it's, it's not recognizing the higher question of principle that comes first. So hopefully that's clear. We, if people have questions on it, we can come back to it. But I just wanted to introduce that higher conception because most people today, as they confront the broader consequences of the failures of truly of true United States leadership, meaning that the principles of our constitution, the principles of the American system of economics, that when, when those are removed, you get the United States, United States acting in essence as the dumb giant for globalist British imperial interests. And what we have to do today is not simply try to respond to the acts by our own government, our own elite, our own think tanks, or so-called own. I mean, most of them are funded by oil states, our, the, the Wall Street institutions, but to say, what is the principle of the United States and its commitments? And that's why we talk so much about the national banking, about the American system, about the development characteristics, because that's an embedded factor. It was an embedded and intrinsic question in the premise of self-government at the earliest stages of the Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay colonies. There's, there was no distinction between the development of economy, what became the American system under Hamilton, and the responsibilities of a self-governing people. So in that regard, what Lyndon LaRouche proposed um, as, the, as the, uh, the weight of the world was increasingly shifting towards Asia, where you have now over a billion people in China. Currently, it's, it's, it's decreasing in some ways. You have over a billion in India. I think it's still increasing in some ways. Um, you have major economic capabilities in Japan and South Korea. You have um, over half a billion uh, in Southeast Asia alone and quickly growing, a younger generation. And then you have the broader Eurasian perspective. But in this area of East and South Asia, this is a characteristic of rapidly developing economies and population growth. Now, there are, there are challenges there, even since LaRouche emphasized the policy. But what he called for, and I believe is the immediate step that a president of the United States has to take today, is to call a summit of the leaders of the United States, the president, in this case, it would be President Trump, who has the capability and qualities to do this, President Putin of Russia, President Xi of China, and Prime Minister Modi of India. Those four nations, the four leaders, the translators, and that's it. Put them in a room and let them hash out the questions at hand to some degree. This is not a question of forming an alliance. This is a question of, as treaties were in previous periods, to ensure a stable environment for the world generally. But in this case, this is not one of colonial uh, states like the British Empire, like the French, and others who would look to make agreements. This was kind of what was the basis for World War II in some cases, was an Anglo-Japanese alliance for, for supporting their broader imperialism. Japan's imperial tendencies towards Korea and Manchuria, Britain's imperialism towards India. They resolved those in 1902 and basically were staging a possible uh, direct attack on the United States from both the East and the West. And we had a, a, a red orange war plan prepared in the Pentagon to respond to a war with both 
both the British Empire and Japan. In 1922, this changes and becomes a four power agreement between the British, French, Japanese, and the United States. Some ways to try to keep the broader China market open. That was the one aspect of it in some ways. But it was colonial powers, French colonial interests in South, South China, um, Indochina, Vietnam area, British interests, Japanese colonial interests. And the United States had become somewhat a member of that area because of the, the, the Philippines had become, in essence, of some form of colony of the United States. This four power agreement is something different because at core is a principle, a principle of the right of nations to advance and develop. That's got to be the critical question. And at core, the, na the national banking system we've discussed, this American system of economics has to be made something conscious and at core the basis of a system of sovereign nations in the world today. If you're going to eradicate globalism, you have, and globalists in our own nation, in our own government, in your political party, you have to have a program to eradicate and eliminate globalism itself as a system. The globalization, the British imperial tendencies, the liberal imperial tendencies, they have to be replaced with a, a substantial policy based on principle not based on practical adaptations of what might work for a few more years. Stop the adaptations, stop the compromises. Now, one aspect of this, which I just wanna highlight, and then, uh, and then maybe we can get into discussion and questions. Um, and we can imagine, remember P President Trump had this meeting, I think it was 2018, with President Putin in Helsinki, Finland. It was just Trump and Putin and the translators. That was it. And it went, it caused these globalist neocon traders in our own country to go apoplectic. But President Trump has the capability to deal with these kinds of questions. He has a close relationship with Modi. He knows President Xi. This is not to be a, a brotherhood discussion, a discussion amongst just simply friends but it's to recognize there is one threat to humanity on this planet. There is one true ideological threat, and that is globalism, whether it's in a communist form, which it was in the Soviet Union, or if it's in a neoliberal fashion today. It is that imp British imperial Anglo-Dutch globalist agenda. You can give its origins, we can recognize it as an ideological structure, but it fails to adapt to the real nature of the, of the human species and of the importance of the patriotism of nations, of the love of one's people, the love of, of, of one's culture, and the ability to discuss the profound ideas within that context. This has to be created. It cannot be created simply by a president acting. If one thing was proven in Trump's first term, it was this. If you expect one person as courageous and tough as Trump might be, he will not be able to eradicate this scourge of globalism without the American people rising to the occasion and to consider the broad policies and steps that have to be taken. What, what Lyndon LaRouche recognized within each of those other three nations, like the United States, is that there is a recognition both culturally within its people and even within elements of each of their governments each of their governments have se severe areas of compromise, some more than others. But within each of them, there is a sense of this question of sovereignty and the right to develop as a people that is the first and foremost responsibility of the government, of a principle of sovereignty. Each of them have faced the imperial tendencies. India, we all know. Russia has faced perpetual threats of invasion coming from the West, whether it's Napoleon, Hitler, or now NATO. And of course, China has had its own problems and, um, in the past, so, as we know with the opium wars is one example. So there's a recognition, a historical reference, but we cannot allow the anti-American cynics to deploy and operate as if somehow a practical agreement 
of multipolarity can replace the very profound principles of what the US constitutional system represents. That preamble of the constitution, that devotion and dedication of the responsibilities of what governments are and the means to accomplish them through the American system. Now I'll give you a sense let me just share this screen one more time. This is also a major factor in the United States today. Now, this is released March 17th, 2022, four days ago, by the United States Geological Society. It's a drought map. Now, the, um, some of these areas in the far west have been more severe in the recent period. California, I believe, is on its third year of another severe drought. There was one that lasted for five years that started like 10 years ago. The, it's as intense of a drought in the third year this year as it was in the fifth year of the last one because it's compounding, compounding problems. Devastations of forests, increased costs, lack of water distribution, um, more pumping of, of groundwater. But what you've seen over the course of the last, and Keisha and I actually both ran, she ran for US Senate in 2014, I ran a US congressional race. And the premise of that was a collaborative effort to address the drought in the Southwest of the United States and in the West. And we have a big policy proposal, a big, program of development. But look at the drought areas into the Midwest, into Minnesota, Wisconsin, even Northern Michigan. This was so much, I was shocked to see this. Look at the droughts into Louisiana. All of Louisiana is now in a status of drought. Now the drought numbers are gonna be based on average rainfall and how far short you've come in average rainfall. But you can even see even in Florida and this in the coastal regions. Now, by no means are we making an argument, or am I making an argument, that this is global warming. There are changes to weather. There are long cyclical changes, hundreds of years changes that are cyclical, to some extent based on astronomical cycles. But the question is, this is a crisis. The questions of power, of water, of distribution, of development of land. These are the questions that have to be taken up by a sovereign people, right? We're wealthier as a nation when our land is becoming more productive, whether through mining of minerals and resources, through agricultural production, yields per acre, industrial territory, the development of effective uh, housing and cultural centers and new cities, that when we make our land more productive, more enriching, and this goes beyond even our territory, but even to the territory of things like the moon, which is part of the Artemis plan. When we take on those types of changes, making a permanent base on the moon for constant research and education for our children, that that's the kind of process we should be engaged in. We become wealthier as a nation. When you let your nation fall into devastation, droughts, collapsing infrastructure, collapsing power supply, you will It'll, it will compound as a drought compounds. And as we continue to ignore these real problems, then we're, we're facing an increasing crisis. Now at core of this has really been a cultural crisis. We are confronting that in ways today that we have never confronted it. The American people today are mobilized in ways patriotic factions throughout our country in the smallest of towns and even to some of the, in some cases, even in the bigger cities, though and generally it's in smaller towns, but it's everywhere in the country, are recognizing that there has been a, a cultural, there is a deep cultural crisis and that the tide must change, an inflection point must be reached. And that we are increasingly going into that process. You can see how people are responding even to the Ukraine propaganda and psychological operations. President Trump has continued to invoke a sense of optimism that the best is yet to come. What we have to recognize is that 
this kind of momentum, this political army that's being built has to be able to take the responsibility for the broad strategic questions in front of us, that big decisions have to be made, big steps, overhauling the Federal Reserve System into a national banking system, extending the credit to address these crises of drought, water, power, industry, food production within, within the country, and establishing that kind of commitment that we have in our nation and within our principles as the guiding principles for every nation to make them possible. So that's what we're proposing. That's what I wanted to raise for the discussion tonight. And um, I guess we should open it up and have at it and, and see what you guys think.